Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you that are, you know, in US time zones, I suppose. Um, welcome to this afternoon session of the general track. Again, the general track is covering talks that are general to the scientific Python ecosystem that is helpful to all different scientific domains. Um, before we get started, I just want to say we have two options for questions and answers. You can either type a question in the Q&A, and then I will read that in the Q&A session at the end. Or if you raise your hand, we can bring you up on stage and you can ask a question like you might at an uh, in-person conference. I encourage you to use either one. However, I'd love to see your lovely faces. So please join us up here on the party stage. It's going to be great. Um, and uh, Ralph and Serge, I'll give you a twenty. I'll give you a five-minute warning uh, for questions, so that way you can leave enough time for all the curious minds for your talk. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have Serge Gelton and Ralph Gommers, and they're going to be talking about building SciPy kernels with Python. Oh, hi, everybody. I'm Serge, and as you can guess from my uh, terrible accent, I'm from France. And I can also introduce Ralph, uh, who is going to, we are going to present our joint work over the past six months on SciPy and PyTran. And we've got a very long story to, to tell you, but with a lot of insight, so I, I hope you will enjoy that. So Ralph, next slide. So uh, to begin with, let's have a look at the SciPy code base. So SciPy is obviously a Python package, but uh, when you dive into the internals, you realize that Python is indeed used for all for gluing all the other parts of the code and for everything that is not critical in terms of performance. But uh, whenever you need performance, uh, other language are used, and actually more than one. So the um, Siphon is used for the critical parts and People love it for the mix of C and Python aspects. But you also have some legacy code in, in Fortran, which code that works and that keeps working and nobody wants to touch it, so it remains as is. And you also have C and C++ for where performance is most needed and people want to show their skills. Uh, unfortunately, all this language don't make it easy for newcomers to write uh, new fast SciPy kernels. So uh, we've been looking for other options. Next. And one of the possible options that I'm uh, impersonating uh, today is Python. So Python is, or Pitran, like every French people should say. Uh, it's a compiler. It's a compiler for um, scientific kernels written in Python, in pure Python. So you don't need to put any annotation or to learn a new syntax, a new language. That's pure Python. But it's not only uh, for loops and uh, array accesses. You also have access to a large subset of the NumPy API, which make it easier to write uh, high-level uh, kernels and not uh, C-like kernels. And underneath, underneath, it works both as a regular compiler, optimizing the Python code, and then turning it into a C++ representation that gets compiled by any backend compiler you want to use. Uh, it's high-level, but you can still use explicit looping like you would do in, in Siphon but without the performance impact of doing it in Python. And you don't have any runtime dependencies. That is, you end up with uh, native code that just depend on the Python native library, and that's all. So uh, it's easier to ship once you manage to compile. So what does it look like? Well, so that's a kernel from the SciPy code base. The only extra step to convert it uh, into a Python uh, compatible input is this extra comment that basically describes the signature of uh, the function. So here we have only one comment, but you can list several of them if you have several overloads or if your function accepts several types. And you can see that uh, you've got some explicit looping because maybe your kernel is too difficult to express in pure NumPy. But you can also 
have um, NumPy high level function call like np.roll at the end of the function. And you have explicit indexing, but here you don't need to, um, to specify whether this is going to overflow or not because uh, Python as a compiler computes the bounds and if the bounds are easy to compute and within the size of the array, then uh, you have fast access without any overflow checks. Otherwise, that's pure Python, and anyone familiar with NumPy should be able to read and maintain it. That's the main advantage. Uh, next. And if you want to um, prototype with Python, just like uh, you would do in a notebook, you can have uh, this extra Python cell, and you type it, type in your Python code, and once you uh, run the cell uh, underneath, it compiles it and exposes the function to the current uh, namespace, and you can just use the Python version as if it were the Python version. There is sim similar magic for Siphon, and Python just does the same. Next. Uh, at some point, when you're happy with the performance, uh, you may want to integrate your new kernel into your larger project. So there are several ways to do that. Um, we all love these two tools and this great way of packaging Python code, so we do integrate with that. Uh, it's much like uh, a Siphon extension or a native extension. You, press, you give the name of the Python module, and it's a regular Python module that you can execute as usual, but if you give it as a Python extension, it will get compiled and shipped into your code, either as C++ source or as native source, depending on, on your setup. And if you're using the Python code as part of a more complex project, for instance, uh, if you're using make files or CMake or whatever you want, you can also use Python from the command line and you have all the switches to get the C++ code or the native code passing the optimization flags uh, that, we, that you would pass to a C++ compiler, and you can play with that. So it's compatible with both uh, Python and a more native uh, approach. Next. But uh, so everything is shiny in Python. Obviously, I say that because I am the author. Uh, Ralph is going to have another point of view, and that's the other part of the talk. But um, there is already a lot of tools that live in this kind of niche of optimizing Python code for science. And the most famous one is Siphon. And I'm not going to say that Siphon is not a great tool. Actually, uh, after watching a talk by Stephen about it, I really appreciate the design and the fact that you can lower a single language to two different aspects, either native code or Python code. So Siphon is great. And from a user point of view, if you have uh, some knowledge of C, you can quite easily grab the, the syntax. And you have got this mixed mode. You have got the possibility to import C or C++ code and use it. That's super great as an extra glue language. Uh, it's also well tested. It's been it's used in NumPy, it's used in SciPy, and in many other projects. So uh, that's really a good choice. But uh, you still need to learn a new language, and you and you when you look for performance, you end up with code that looks more like C with some Python flavors and. Uh, something else. So you lose all the high-level aspects of Python we all are supposed to love. So that's super great, a very good glue language with performance in mind, but um, uh, the situation can be improved. Why don't we use, next slide, Numba to improve the situation? And indeed, Numba is also a great solution. It's great because JIT compiling uh, put a very low burden on the shoulders of the developers. You just need to import the package, install it with pip or conda or whatever, 
and you put a decoration and everything is done. You don't need to worry about interaction with native code or whatever. If you, you install LVM, but you don't even notice it, that's super great. You can target GPUs, which is also a very nice feature. Uh, you're still in pure Python. You have you may use some extra decorator, but that's pure Python. So easy to maintain, easy to dive in, and also not to be neglected, easy to dive out. And when you want to forget and to switch to another tool, you can. Similar command for Python, by the way. But you still need to install um, LLVM, and if you are on a cluster, that may be uh, an issue for uh, the um, administrator of the cluster, or um, you, well, that's not as easy as just getting a, a, um, a native library in. And kind of similar to Siphon, you tend to end up with low level code with loops even when they are NumPy equivalent to the loops because they don't support the whole uh, NumPy um, API. So another trade-off, I would say. If you're thinking about choosing any of these tools, you have to keep that in mind. It's a matter of trade-off. What do you want to do with your native code? What do you value the most? Whether it's portability, runtime dependencies, and such. Depending on your specific choice, you may choose either Siphon or Numba and Python, or Python. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details here. I was quite surprised to see that Python actually generates very small code in terms of size, which may be important uh, if you ship a large, a large project. Uh, Numba is really easier for debugging. That's a very good point, because that's still pure Python in the end. Um, I would say that Siphon is better than Python for optimization, because they have this uh, web feedback or of each line, whether it was translated to C or to or kept to the Python C API level. Uh, for ease of use, that's for sure. A JIT compiler and single code decorator is great. Siphon is battle tested, so a lot of features. Uh, one thing that also uh, need to be kept in mind is um, most of this, well, both Siphon and Python have a very low bus factor, which is one for sure for Python, and one and a half maybe for Siphon, and maybe two for Numba. So those are projects that are all widely used, but uh, with um, there is a, a small risk there if you plan your code for 50 years or, or something like that. So maybe that's something to consider. But as uh, the code is um, the cost to go out of, the code is not that high for Numba and Python. I think that's something you can you can pay for. Um, I you can notice that optimization or speed is not part of. Uh, this chart. The reason for it is that most of the time you get comparable performance. Sometimes Siphon is faster, sometimes Python is faster, and everything changes for each between releases. So you basically get the performance of the of a naive code you would write in C. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's not. But that's not the most critical point uh, when you would need to decide. And next, I think that's my next next slide is my last, or maybe it's Ralph's. I, I think it's my turn. OK, I'll leave it to you. All right, so thanks, Serge. So the message of this complicated slide is pick your poison, I guess. So we also tried to like boils down into more pragmatic advice, like when should you use what? And basically, what it came down to, to for me was this. Like, if you ha if you're of a higher level Pure Python package, uh, you know that may depend on NumPy or SciPy or Scikit-Learn, whatever. Like if you don't have any compiled code yet, you probably want to pick Numba, because adding like the first bit of Python or Scython is extremely expensive in terms of like you know packaging. You're gonna go from like hey you know I run Python setup.py as this, I upload it to PyPI, I'm done, 
to having a ton of machinery and having to produce like 25 wheels. Uh, but once you do have that, like if you already have one C extension, like you're already in that situation, at that point, you really don't want the number runtime extension anymore, probably. Um, so your your best choices are probably Python for standalone kernels, because it really is the nice and easy like development experience in pure Python like Numba, but without the runtime dependency. And you know you're still going to need Cyton for some situations that only Cyton can do, like binding C or C++ code or interacting with the Python C API, the NumPy C API, or just mixing Python and C. Um, this is, for SciPy, the situation is we already had a very complex build situation and a very easy runtime situation. So if you type pip install SciPy, you basically get only one thing, that's NumPy, and nothing else. And we really wanted to keep it that way. Uh, if you're a Conda Forge, you also get like Blast, Laidback, and Python itself. Uh, those are really also runtime dependencies. Only on PyPI, we cannot, you know, basically express that. Uh, so this is what changed for SciPy when we added Python. Um, we basically added this red box here um, that it only shows up at build time. So it's really only the maintainers that have to deal with it and like a couple of users that deal, you know, are built from source. But for the vast majority of users, this is completely invisible. Um, so where are we at now? We have one large Python extension. Uh, it's a new class that was in the last release, RBF interpolator. It's a new radial basis function uh, interpolation functionality. And it was, I think, about 18 functions. Uh, and only three of those, the, the machinery had to be annotated with like basically one code comment each, like the Python and other type annotations. And the rest of it really was unchanged pure Python, and Python just compiled it and used it just fine. And then there are several smaller extensions um, in, in Optimize, in Signal, and in Stats. Uh, and they're really like the, you know, 20 to 40 lines of code, like a single function, like a hotspot that needed to be accelerated. Uh, and there's a bunch more PRs in progress. Uh, many of those are coming from uh, Xinyu Liu, who is our uh, the GSC student uh, on SciPy that uh, Serge and I are jointly mentoring. And she's working on basically writing benchmarks and finding new opportunities to accelerate things. Uh, probably the most impactful one she's done so far is bin statistic DD, which I know is a hotspot for many people that do like geospatial analysis, for example. And it's sped up by up to 30 times. Uh, and then there's a couple of other smaller functions she's uh, done so far. And typical, you know, for a few times when it was already in Cyton, the third, the last one here, the sort vertices of regions was in Cyton. So we wrote it in Python, so the code became a little easier, and it was three times faster. Uh, and then the, the Summers D, which is a new statistical test, uh, was up to 20 times faster. Uh, so she's, she's having a blog that she updates weekly. So if you're interested, uh, I recommend you check it out. Uh, so what has been the impact so far? Like, you know, let's start with the good news. Um, developer experience is nice. Um, and we've had like multiple other people try it, and they're you know the, the reactions were uniformly like this is a very nice experience. Um, it's been fast uh, right now. It doesn't use SIMD instructions, and it's typically you know, at least as fast as Cyton. Once you know, Serge is actually working on SIMD instructions, uh, and that will likely make it a lot faster still, uh, especially for you know the parts that use NumPy code. Um, produced binaries are about 10 times smaller in Cyton, which doesn't matter so much for smaller packages, but SciPy, like the size is becoming a problem, especially for niche applications like uploading it to AWS Lambda. It kind of just fits now, so adding a lot more binaries you know, isn't ideal. Uh, and Python itself, I find it easy to contribute to. Uh, I've also tried to contribute to like other compiler practices in the past and usually failed because they're hard, but Python is relatively approachable code base. Um, there's some gaps in functionality. A, like a big one is numpy.random. 
um, because a limitation Python has is generate static C++. So it doesn't call back into Python. So it cannot use the numpy.random machinery. Um, so that's, I think, the main one. And then the other one is APIs with too much dynamic behavior, like a keep them keyword. Basically, it's a true false that kind of switches the return type or the return shape of the array. Ralph, um, you have about uh, five minutes left, so to give five minutes for questions, OK? Thanks. You'll be good. Two more slides. Um, so one other thing to note is there's no escape hatch. So this is the thing with uh, Cython. Like you start in Python and kind of there's always this escape hatch is like, you know, if, if things get bad and like it's not supported, you just write a row of C. Like you can't do that in Python. So it either is supported or it's not supported. And if it's not, you have to go implement it in Python first. Which I'm not sure is like that bad a situation because you don't really want to be writing raw C. That's why we started this project in the first place. Uh, but it is something to keep in mind. Um, there's also no threading. That's specifically for SciPy. Python is actually pretty good in generating, you know, OpenMP code. Uh, but OpenMP is forbidden in SciPy for reasons. Uh, so we only use custom thread pools, and you know, Python can't do that. And there's, there's one constraint, which isn't that bad. Uh, but on Windows, it must build with the Clang CL compiler. That basically comes with MSVC. Uh, so it, it, it wasn't much of an issue, which is surprising, because Windows is always an issue. But in this case, it wasn't too bad. Um, so where we are at now is we just shipped the SciPy 1.7 release that has Python code in it. Um, it's also enabled by default. But it's still optional. So you're going to set an environment variable to turn it off. And then you get the pure Python version or the Cyton version, you know, whatever it was before. There is a fallback. Um, then there were a few hiccups, like there always are when you introduce something like introduce a new compiler. Uh, we had a small portability issue in AIX, which is not surprising because you know, we don't test AIX. The, the more surprising part was like the fix was six lines of code, and it arrived within three days. Like Our previous AIX issues were usually open for years because you know, they were hard, or nobody bothered to fix them. So it's actually nice that, that Search is a very responsive maintainer, and also a good sign that the actual fix is so small. Um, PyPy, I don't know. It just has many other issues. It doesn't work with SciPy. So uh, we don't know. Uh, it'd be nice to figure it out, but that's for some later time. Uh, and other than that, it's been pretty smooth. We did have a few, like, you know, in the initial build system integration with this tutels, uh, which Search was justifiably sarcastic about. So, like, you know, we, need, we needed a couple of minor releases to kind of iron that out a little bit. Um, so, in conclusion, like SciPy contributors like Python, like we got like literal comments like, hey, this code is very elegant, or I'm surprised it's that fast given it looks exactly like my initial pure Python prototype. Um, our initial goal is make it easier to write fast kernels. I think we've achieved that. Um, but we're not there yet. Like SciPy, you know, has a lot of really demanding requirements and maintainers. So basically, everything has to be better. Uh, so we still have to decide whether it becomes a hard build dependency uh, for the next release you know, by Christmas or so. Um, and that means like, you know, we probably have to revisit the PyPy situation and see it doesn't spew too many build warnings on Windows and you know, things like that. And then we had a bonus question that we haven't figured out yet, uh, but we thought of last week. Like, there's actually another Python to uh, C++ transpiler, which is in shipped with CuPy. Uh, it's actually pretty cool. So it emits C++ code that you know knows how to deal with CUDA. So you know maybe we could glue those together, not in SciPy, in some experimental package, and you know write pure Python code and get fast CPU and GPU code. Maybe for next year's talk. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, Hope there's some questions. Yay, thank you.
Um, thank you both for a great talk. Very seamless transition, very impressive, so good. Um, and you have a lot of comments, so it seems like um, you kept your audience very involved, so great job. We have a couple questions. Um, so I'm gonna just go from um, the most popular, I know, the meanest way. So um, the first one is from Brigitta, or Brigitta, um, which is, if a project already uses Cython, would you recommend to invest in switching? When do you think it's reasonable to consider a switch? Um, I think it depends on how much you, you know, if people are happy, if your contributors or your and your maintainers are happy writing Cython and all your pure Python code that needs accelerating is accelerated, right? there probably isn't a reason. Uh, the situation we were more in is like, there was a bunch of Cython code, but most people are very uncomfortable writing Cython code. I would say like 80% of contributors at least has never used Cython before. And like it has a pretty steep learning curve. So we were we were still having a lot of pure Python code that wanted, you know, that needed to be faster. Um, and we saw it wasn't happening. So that's why it was a good reason for us. So I think that's how you should look at it. How many people are going to be using it and how much benefit they're going to get out of it over like a couple of years. And I would add that um, Siphon, if you're using Siphon to you to access some third party native libraries, then that's something Python can't do for you. So there are some features from Siphon that can't be used in, in Python. OK, thank you. And so I just want to like say something from the beginning of the chat, which is your accent is great. I don't think uh, you need to apologize ever. It's excellent. Um, OK. Our, I um, apologize so that people say that, and it's always uh, nice. Oh, you're just compliment. like leading them no. into compliments. <laughs> that's a oh. OK, I see. Um, OK, well, our next um, question is, uh, oops. Um, what is the experience in mixing Cython and Python if there's a lot of existing Cython code? Well, we, we don't mix it. I mean, we have both in the same code base, but it doesn't interact with each other. It, it's in different functions that are just accelerated individually. And I think oh. you don't want to try and mix it. <laughs> OK. But, um, there is uh, a hook in Cython. You can activate Python from within Cypher. In, in, in that case, your NumPy, some of the NumPy call you would, that Cypher would translate to C API are translated to Python. That's relatively experimental, but it has been fixed by the last release. And But I don't think there are a lot of users for that feature. But at least it's possible to mix the two from, from Cypher. OK. Okay, our next question is, are there any plans for Python to support classes? Uh, there is no classes in Fortran 77, and everybody is happy with Fortran 77. So that's the short answer. No, the, the real answer is, it depends on what kind of use you want to make of classes. If it's classes that, don't, that only inherit from objects, and are basically there to all the state, no inheritance and nothing else. Even with that, with these constraints, it's kind of difficult, but it's in the plan. It's difficult because internally, Python is generating um, polymorphic C++ code without taking into account any type annotation, and then this generic C++ code is instantiated for the given types. So basically, Python doesn't understand anything about the types until the very end. And classes make that much more complex, basically. So yeah, I want to do that for very simple situations. But even that small step is going to cost me a lot. OK, thank you. Um, so I just want to say that we have a lot of questions in the Q&A, but we are going to run out of time. So I encourage all of the people who've asked questions who your question has not been asked to contact the speakers when we go to Gather Town a little bit later. Or you can 
DM people in Airmead itself. However, I definitely encourage it to happen in Gathertown. Then other people can join you and you can have a great conversation about Python. Um, so we'll ask one more question. This is from Tom Caswell. Um, are there reasons for no OpenMP in a sci-fi? Um, I, I guess the most important one is it, OpenMP is very hard to control, and it, it plays really badly with multiprocessing. There's a lot of users that like using multiprocessing for trivial uh, parallelism. And you get the oversubscription problem, where if you have eight cores, you know, you're going to spin up eight processes, and each process is going to have eight threads, and everything's going to grind to a halt. So we can't really introduce it uh, without that. There's an, there's an issue on the SciPy issue tracker that we really should turn into docs. Um, there, there are more reasons related to portability, but I think that's the main one. OK, thank you, Ralph. Um, and thank you all for the great questions. Um, I think this is a really great talk. Thank you again, Serge and Ralph. I think you're getting another round of applause from our great audience. Um, the next talk for the general session starts in four minutes. Um, and take a gander at a tour of property-based testing, um, which will be given by Zach Hatfield-Dodds, um, again, in a couple of minutes. And that's all for this session. I'll see you all a little later. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Thanks.